you know, Mars is not yet at the point where where it's sort of terraformed, where, we, where you can live outdoors. So uh, you, you, know, you have to live initially in uh, glass domes or um, something like that. Elon Musk envisions a future where humans live on Mars in a vibrant futuristic city protected by gleaming glass domes. While this idea is exciting and often seen in science fiction, it's unlikely to become a reality anytime this century. If we are serious about settling on Mars, the first Mars base will likely look much more like a balloon than a city. This is why inflatable structures are currently the most practical option for early Mars colonization. Imagine you are planning to live on Mars for an extended period. That means bringing a significant amount of infrastructure to build a base. However, because rockets have limited cargo space, future space habitats must be compact during launch. Now picture a Mars base that folds neatly into a spacecraft's cargo bay and inflates into a comfortable living space upon arrival. That's exactly what inflatable structures offer. These systems are lightweight, flexible, and capable of expanding into spacious habitats once deployed. In recent years, inflatable space structures have become a serious alternative to traditional rigid modules. Researchers around the world have spent decades advancing this technology, developing ultra-strong materials to endure the harsh space environment, creating sophisticated models to predict inflation behavior, and engineering ways for these structures to remain rigid after deployment without needing constant internal pressure. To improve how efficiently the inflatable structure can be stored, different folding patterns were tested to reduce the required storage space. Previous research at the University of Strathclyde focused on folding methods for deployable membranes and solar sails. Among the folding techniques studied, the star folding pattern and the Mayura Ori pattern were found to offer the best balance between compact storage and simple deployment. Tests showed that the star folding pattern could achieve a packaging efficiency of 40%. However, these tests used very thin membrane materials, so it is recommended that future studies focus on folding thicker bladder materials, as their different properties are likely to have a significant effect on how well they can be packed. Anyway, a spacecraft like SpaceX's Starship with its massive cargo capacity could easily carry an entire inflatable habitat and still have plenty of room for additional cargo and equipment. <laughs> the material used for an inflatable space structure needs to include components for holding air, providing strength, and offering protection. The air bladder, which holds the air and plays a key role in inflating the base, can be made from several materials. A study identified options such as ethylene vinyl alcohol, polyvinyldene chloride, polymide, polyethylene, and polyurethane. Among these, ethylene vinyl alcohol is the most effective for keeping air inside, but it has weak mechanical strength and is sensitive to moisture. To improve the overall strength and stiffness of the structure, a layer of Kevlar-49 was added. Kevlar-49 offers a good balance between cost and mechanical performance, making it a suitable choice for the restraining layer. To make space structures strong enough to resist impacts from micrometeoroids and space debris, they must transition from a flexible, inflated shape to a stiff, rigid form. This process, called rigidization, also ensures that the structure no longer depends on inflation gas to maintain its shape after deployment. There are different ways to achieve rigidization. One method uses heat-activated materials where a fabric soaked in a special resin hardens when exposed to heat from the sun or built-in heaters. Another method relies on materials that remain flexible while warm but become rigid in the cold temperatures of space. Some structures use resins that cure when exposed to ultraviolet UV light, either from the sun or from embedded UV lights within the structure itself. An older approach, used by NASA in the 1960s, involves thin layers of aluminum and plastic. When stretched beyond a certain point and then released, the layers settle into a stiff shape due to the way the materials react to stress and compression. Despite these techniques, there are challenges. In real-life conditions, rigidization may not happen evenly, and this unevenness is difficult to predict or simulate accurately. Additionally, some rigidization materials can be toxic, so it's important to design the structure in a way that protects the crew, such as using extra protective layers to contain harmful substances. One of the most pressing concerns raised by skeptics of Mars exploration is radiation protection. Unlike Earth, which benefits from a strong magnetic field that shields us from harmful cosmic and solar radiation, Mars has a much weaker magnetic field. This makes the Martian surface far more exposed to radiation levels that pose significant risks to human health. The inflatable habitat is at least as safe, or maybe even safer, than anything we have now. Hydrogen is highly effective at blocking radiation, which is why water is also often considered a shielding material. As I mentioned earlier, one of the materials we use for our Mars base is polyethylene, which is a plastic polymer rich in hydrogen. Polyethylene can be woven into a durable matrix and layered into the shell of inflatable habitats, providing robust protection. 
Additionally, scientists are exploring biological approaches to radiation shielding. A particular fungus, Cladosporium spherospermum, has shown promise due to its ability to thrive in high radiation environments by producing melanin, a pigment that may aid in radiation absorption and cellular repair. There is also interest in extremophiles like tardigrades, microscopic invertebrates known for their remarkable ability to survive extreme radiation, which could inform future protective strategies or even bioengineered solutions. Once the module has been constructed, it's crucial to establish a life-sustaining atmosphere. Obtaining a reliable source of oxygen is paramount as the Martian atmosphere is composed of about 95% carbon dioxide. On the International Space Station, ISS, Oxygen is generated through the electrolysis of water, a system capable of producing up to 160 liters of gaseous oxygen per hour. However, this method may not be ideal for Mars as it requires a constant and substantial supply of water, which is a limited resource on the Red Planet. While there is evidence of subsurface ice, extracting it in large quantities is difficult and may not be sustainable for long-term oxygen production. To address this, NASA has developed a groundbreaking technology for producing oxygen directly from the Martian atmosphere. The MOXIE device aboard the Perseverance rover made history as the first successful demonstration of in situ resource utilization on Mars. MOXIE draws in Martian air, heats it, and uses a solid oxide electrolysis process to break down carbon dioxide into oxygen and carbon monoxide. In just nine hours of operation, it produced 50 grams of oxygen. While that amount may seem small, it's important to remember that this was only a technology demonstration and a successful one. The next step is to scale the technology for future crewed missions. And let's not forget about energy. Powering the Martian habitat is another major challenge. Transporting batteries or fossil fuels from Earth to Mars is currently not practical due to cost and payload limitations. There are two primary energy sources under consideration, solar power and nuclear power. Solar energy is relatively affordable and effective for missions near Earth and Mars, where sunlight is still strong enough to generate usable power. Meanwhile, NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy have collaborated on the Kilopower Project, which successfully demonstrated a small nuclear reactor capable of producing 10 kilowatts of energy in a lunar simulation. To further scale this technology, 12-month contracts have been awarded to Lockheed Martin, Westinghouse, and a joint venture between Intuitive Machines and X-Energy to develop designs capable of producing 40 kilowatts. Although wind power hasn't been fully explored on Mars, it holds potential as a complementary source to solar energy. Martian winds are strongest at night, which could help balance the limitations of solar panels during dark periods. And just like that, we have a home on Mars. It might not look as sleek as a futuristic glass dome, but it gets the job done. One of the biggest advantages of inflatable habitats is their simplicity compared to more complex construction methods. Another key benefit is that this technology is already within reach. Sierra Space Corporation, the same company behind the Dream Chaser space plane, is working with Blue Origin to develop the Orbital Reef space station. As part of that effort, they've designed the Large Integrated Flexible Environment, or LIFE Habitat, which is essentially a giant inflatable space station module. When fully inflated, the LIFE Habitat stands approximately 9 meters tall and measures 8.2 meters in diameter, offering roughly one-third the internal volume of the entire International Space Station in a single module. In its compacted form, life fits neatly inside a standard 5-meter rocket fairing, such as the one used on top of a Falcon 9. Once deployed into orbit, the habitat self-inflates and uses its built-in thruster system to maneuver to its final orbital destination. The thick, multi-layered shell surrounding the habitat is engineered to withstand micrometeoroid impacts, orbital debris, internal pressure, and space radiation. Its primary material is Vectrin, a high-strength chemically woven fiber used in NASA's spacesuits that is five times stronger than steel when inflated. This flexible material can absorb and deflect impacts more effectively than titanium or Kevlar, acting like a bulletproof vest for space. To demonstrate the structure's strength, Sierra Space has conducted extensive testing, including overpressure tests where the habitat is inflated until it bursts. A full-scale prototype has already exceeded NASA's recommended safety margins, withstanding up to five times the ambient pressure. In the latest burst test, engineers included a metallic blanking plate to simulate a window substructure, a crucial feature for future long-duration missions. This rigid plate also serves as a secure mounting point for robotic arms, antennas, and other external equipment. 
Elon Musk isn't just interested in visiting Mars once. His goal is to make life multi-planetary. He believes that expanding the scope and scale of human consciousness will help us better understand the universe and ensure the long-term survival of civilization. In the unlikely event that something catastrophic happens to Earth, having a self-sustaining presence on Mars could preserve human consciousness beyond our planet. As Musk put it, that's one of the benefits of Mars, its life insurance for all of us. Eventually, all life on Earth will be destroyed by the sun. The sun is gradually expanding, and at some point, we will need to become a multi-planet civilization because Earth will be incinerated. He estimates we have about 450 million years before the sun becomes hot enough to make life on Earth impossible. Of course, that future is still very far away, but in my opinion, setting foot on Mars would be a milestone as historic as Neil Armstrong's moon landing more than 60 years ago. That moment captivated billions, and a Mars landing could do the same. It has the power to inspire, to unite, and to remind us of what humanity can achieve when we dream big. So when a billionaire wants to spend their fortune turning that dream into reality, I say go for it. What about you? Do you think humans will live on Mars anytime soon? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Your support helps us keep creating quality content. Thanks for watching.